So last time we learned about object-oriented programming and also inheritance, polymorphism, and genetic programming. Today we continue with uh, two issues. The first issue is sometimes classes only group properties that are used in the subclasses. So they are not in fact uh, used for creating concrete objects. They are only used for inheriting uh, the correct or uh, common properties of uh, multiple subclasses. The second part of this lecture will be about interfaces. In Java, there is a restriction that a class can only extend another class. So we have, in fact, a single inheritance hierarchy, which has a single root, which is the object class, the root of all the, the ancestor of all classes in Java. However, a class can also implement multiple interfaces. Uh, and we don't have any more restrictions of having one single interface. We can have as many interfaces as we want. In fact, interfaces, again, they are only defined to specify what methods, which are abstract uh, in the interface, are implemented by the subclasses. So we are going to talk about the uses of interfaces, and then we are going to sh see an example, which uh, is in the graphical user interfaces which is JavaFX. Uh, JavaFX is a classical example, or graphical user interfaces are a classical example of uh, interfaces. So feel free to ask questions during the uh, lecture. And from time to time, I will stop to see if there are any questions, and I will respond to those questions that are not yet already answered by the TAs. So we start from the same application that we talked about last class, which was, let's assume that we want to implement a graphical user interface similar to paint, where we have multiple geometric figures like uh, circles, rectangles, squares, or triangle, as in the lab today. And we want to group all the properties that are in common to all geometric objects into a superclass, which is only implemented once, so we don't have any duplication of code. Like, for instance, not every class will have to redefine the fact that all of these classes have a, all of these objects have a color, a data, data field, uh, uh, field uh, date created, and so on. So first thing that we see is that the geometric object uh, class is in italic. The, the meaning of that is that this geometric class, uh, geometric object class, is an abstract class. Uh, in UML diagrams, it's common that we italicize uh, the notation for abstract classes. Uh, if we write uh, such a diagram by hand, we can actually annotate it with uh, a string or precede it with a string that says abstract. That means that the, this specific class is abstract. Now, this class has three properties, which are private, color, field, and date created. All of them are defined as private, and we have accessors and mutators for uh, the color. You see, get string and set, uh, get color and set color, and is field and set field, and an accessor for the date created. It returns the date created, or the date that this class, objects, instances of this class, are created. We also overwrite the method to string, which is inherited from the object class uh, with our own definition of to string. And we have two abstract methods. So abstract methods are methods which are uh, defined without an implementation, without a body, in the abstract class. They basically are constraints to the subclasses that any subclass of this uh, abstract class geometric object must implement the two abstract methods, get area and get perimeter. Again, the notation is either that we italicize the two methods, or if we are writing these methods, we have to specify an annotation abstract. Uh, we can put it before the method uh, definition or before the method signature, we can specify that this is an abstract method. The meaning of that is that the, any concrete subclass of the geometric object class must implement these methods. 
At the level of geometric object, we don't know how to implement get area and get perimeter because we don't have any sizes. But any subclass like circle and rectangle must implement these methods. And in the case of circle, it will be radius square multiplied with the value of map dot pi. In the case of rectangle, it will be the width multiplied with the height. And similarly for the perimeter, we can get uh, the uh, perimeter of the circle uh, or the uh, perimeter of the rectangle from the sizes of these uh, geometric figures. So we still say that the get area and get perimeter methods are overridden in the class, in the subclasses circle and rectangle. And these are abstract methods in the superclass because uh, uh, we don't have sizes for them. In the UML diagram, we don't have to specify the abstract methods also in the subclasses because uh, we know that they must be implemented in the subclasses. So let's continue. The way to, to declare when we declare these classes in Java is to specify the modifier abstract uh, in front of the class. So we have the public abstract class geometric object. The rest of the implementation is the same one that we had last week. Please look at the video for last week or at the lecture notes. We define color, field, and date created as data fields of the specified types string, boolean, and date, Java util date. We have the geometric object constructor. Uh, in this case, you see that we, we can specify that they are public or protected. Protected means that they are available to any subclass. And in the UML diagram, protected is with a hash sign. That means that they will be inherited uh, by any subclass and available to any subclass. Then we have the accessor get color, the mutator set color, which takes a new color string and assigns to the color data field of the current object of this, the formal parameter value color. And then we have the abstract methods, uh, get area and get perimeter. So the definition of those abstract methods is that we define the get area method as being a public abstract double method. And we don't have any implementation. We end the definition with semicolon. In other languages, this could be called virtual methods because they are not implemented in the current class uh, or uh, they will be implemented in subclasses. So let's see such an example. We have the subclass circle, which extends geometric object, adds to the properties or data fields inherited from the superclass, the data field radius. Uh, we have the constructors for circle and accessor for radius and mutator for radius. And then we have the methods uh, that were defined abstract in the superclass. Get area returns the radius square multiplied with math of pi, which is a double, and that is the return type. You see that here we don't specify abstract because this method is actually concrete. It is implemented right here. Then we have other methods which could be new and uh, implemented only in circle, not in geometric object, like get diameter, which returns to multiply with the radius. And then again, we have an implementation of the abstract method that we inherited, which is basically a constraint that we implement the get perimeter method. And in the, in the case of a circle, it returns to multiply with the radius multiplied with pi. Again, we have another method print circle, which uh, prints up the this circle. Next, we have another subclass of geometric object. The class rectangle extends geometric object. And again, we inherit not only the properties and the methods which were declared public or uh, protected in the superclass, but we also inherit, and they are not constructors, we also inherit the constraint to uh, implement the methods get area and get perimeter. So these two methods are implemented in the class rectangle and they return the area or the, in the perimeter of, uh, the, of the rectangle. So how do we use these methods? Here we have a driver class test geometric object, which declares a main method with two geometric objects, 
geo object one, which is a new circle, and geo object two, which is a new rectangle. Because of polymorphies, we can assign the subclass instances of circle and rectangle to the variables, the reference type variables of the type geometric object. If you want to see that the two objects have the same area, we invoke a method equal area. The equal area method, defined as the second method on this lecture note, is a method that takes two geometric object, objects and checks if the areas of these two geometric objects are equal. So you see that in this case, we don't need to check if these are instances of circle or rectangle and invoke those specific methods because these objects are instances of geometric object. As instances of geometric object, we know that this class is abstract and they also, it also has the abstract method get area, which must be implemented in any subclass. So we can invoke the method get area, and through dynamic binding, we get the correct implementation of get area. So we don't have to check that these are instances of circle or rectangle or square or any other subclass of geometric object. We know that any subclass of geometric object must implement the method get area. So all that we need to do is to invoke the method get area, which through dynamic binding it returns the correct. Uh, it executes the correct get area method. Similarly, after we return from the equal uh, area method, we want to display the two objects. So we display geometric object geo object one, which will invoke the method get area and the method get perimeter. So again, the display geometric object doesn't need to know what type of object are we currently printing, because all of the objects of the type geometric object must have a, a, a method get area and the method get perimeter. Those two methods were declared as abstract in the class geometric object, and any abstract method must be implemented in the subclass. Okay. So this is basically the main example of abstract methods in this set of lecture notes. Now we will go over the theory what is the requirement for abstract classes, for abstract methods to be implemented in the subclasses and so on. So, abstract methods can be contained only in abstract classes. You cannot have an abstract method in a non-abstract class. In a non-abstract subclass extended from an abstract class, all the abstract methods must be implemented. This is all that we basically said in the last 5 or 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Even if these methods are not used in the subclass, they must be implemented. Any abstract method uh, which is inherited by a non-abstract subclass must be implemented. However, if the subclass of the abstract class does not implement all the abstract methods, that means that the subclass must be abstract itself. So we can defer the constraint of having to implement all the abstract methods from the superclass if our subclass is also an abstract class. In that case, the subclasses must implement those abstract methods. An object cannot be created out of an abstract class. So these abstract classes can basically can just be used to group properties of the subclasses. We cannot create using the new operator or any other way we cannot create an instance while we are in that class, uh, we cannot create an instance of an abstract class. We can still define constructors. In fact, we must define constructors unless we use a default constructor, which is invoked, which these constructors are invoked during constructor chaining uh, when we invoke the constructors of the subclasses. So, for instance, when we create an, an instance of a circle, or an instance of a rectangle, those constructors through the constructor chaining that we talked about last class, and you can invoke them using the keyword super with arguments, super open parentheses, and you specify which constructor of the subclass super class you want to implement you want to call as the first statement of the subclass constructor, 
you can invoke the constructor of the superclass. Again, to see an example of how to do constructor chaining, please look at the lecture notes from last class when we talked about inheritance. Every time you create an object of a subclass, the first statement in the, super, in the subclass constructor is to call the superclass constructor. Either explicitly you specify super with uh, the parameters or implicitly you will call the default constructor as the first statement of the subclass constructor. A class that contains abstract methods, we saw that it must be abstract. An abstract class can still have no abstract methods. It's basically possible to define an abstract class that contains no abstract methods. We, cannot create, we still cannot create instances of the class using the new operator. And this class is still used as a base case for defining subclasses. So there is no requirement that abstract classes must contain abstract methods. There is only a requirement that abstract methods can only be defined in abstract classes. A subclass can be defined abstract even if its superclass is concrete. For instance, the dramatic object class that we defined is an abstract class. It was defined abstract. However, every class in Java is a subclass if it doesn't have any other superclass, is a subclass of the object class. The object class in Java is concrete. So a subclass can be abstract and its superclass can be concrete. That is fine. A subclass can override a method from its superclass to define it abstract. It's rare but very useful when, implement, when implementing a method in a sub when implementing a method in a sub superclass becomes invalid in the subclass. The subclass must be defined abstract because you can't have abstract methods in subclass, in uh, non-abstract classes. So a subclass can override the method from the superclass and define it abstract. Like for instance, if I want to constrain that every subclass of geometric object must implement a two-string method. I can define the, the toString method in the uh, uh, geometric object class as abstract, which means that any subclass of geometric object must now implement a toString method. Is a way again abstract method is a way to put constraints on the subclasses. Abstract classes can be, be uh, can be used as types. So you cannot create instances using the new operator out of the abstract classes, but the abstract class can be used as a data type. So for instance, we can use the variable C as a reference type variable of the type geometric object. This variable C is assigned a new circle, a concrete non-abstract instance of, a, of the class circle, but we basically use a variable of the type geometric object, which is an abstract class. We can only use the methods for this variable C without casting that are defined in geometric object. Those are the methods for getting the color, the date created, to setting a new color, and also the methods which were declared abstract, get area and get perimeter. Why? Because those methods must be implemented in any subclass of the class geometric object. Those methods were defined as abstract in the geometric object class. We can use the new operator to create an array of geometric objects. So we can still use the new operator on the geometric object, but we are actually not creating instances of that class. We are creating just an array of references which are currently null. There will be 10, in this case, null elements in this array. And if we want to assign uh, one element to this array would be geo of zero is assigned a new circle or a new rectangle. So the new operator can be used to create array, arrays of references of the abstract class. But that is the only uh, use of a new operator for abstract classes. We are not invoking the constructor of that class. Before we are moving to concrete examples of abstract classes in the Java uh, API, let's see if there are any questions about abstract classes.
So there were a couple of questions from Kirk and Kaylee, and they were responded. And before that, there were questions about the uh, homework. So let's take a look at the correct implementations. I already implemented the abstract class geometric object. So you see, this is an abstract class. It defines the data fields, color field, and they created. It has all the methods for this class. In addition, we can define the method, met the public abstract method that returns a double get area. And similarly, we can define the public abstract double method get perimeter. What this means, it means that in any subclass of this class, like for instance the class triangle, which is part of the lab for today, when we extend the class geometric object in the subclass triangle, we can, ex we can add additional uh, sites, like for instance site 1 is 1, site 2 is 1, site 2, site 3 is 1 by default. We can define constructors, of course, by default, we are actually calling the superclass constructor with no parameters when we create a new triangle. So this is basically as the first statement on, of any constructor of subclasses. We have accessors and mutators for our class triangle uh, data fields. And then we have the methods for returning the correct area for a triangle, which uses the Heron formula and the perimeter of a triangle. We also override the method to string. And again, that can, could be defined as abstract in the superclass. We can also define the method public string to string as abstract in the superclass. However, I already defined it above, so I will not define it as abstract in the superclass here. But this is possible. This is totally possible, which now will require that that method is implemented in the subclass. In this case, I actually prefer to declare it in the superclass, and then in the subclass, I could invoke it. In this case, I'm printing that this is a new triangle with the specified sides 1, 2, and 3, plus all the properties that are printed by the toString method in the superclass. It basically says that it's created at the current time. It has a default color, like for instance, red or yellow or blue, or a color that we set ourselves using uh, mutators, like T here is defined as a new triangle with sides 1, 1.5, and 1. And we set the color to yellow. We set the field to true. And then we can print all the properties of this triangle, which is, in fact, the part of the lab for today. In this case, it will print all the properties of the triangle, the area of the triangle, and the perimeter of the triangle. Let's see if there are any questions before we continue. So if there are no questions, let's continue with geometric, with other uh, abstract classes. So in Java, one example of an abstract class is the Java Util Calendar. So before this uh, class, uh, last week, we, we used the Java Util Date. Java Util Date represents a specific instance in time specified with a millisecond from the Linux uh, uh, or the Unix epoch, epoch time. This is uh, January 1st, 1970, and it's basically the Java Util date specify, uh, uses a long value, which is the number of milliseconds that passed since that uh, Unix epoch time. However, if we try to use the method to get the, cur the current day, year, month, hour, and so on, we will see that all of those methods are deprecated. The reason why those methods are deprecated is that 
In Java, there is another class, which is the Java Util Calendar class, which is used for extracting such information, like the year, month, date, hour, minute, second, from a date object for a specific calendar. So there are various calendars. There is the Gregorian calendar, which is the modern calendar that we are using. But there are other older systems, like the lunar calendar, the Jewish calendar, the Chinese calendar, and so on. In Java, the Java Util Calendar class is defined as an abstract class. It basically means that it doesn't specify what type of calendar it is. But there are subclasses of the Java Calendar class, which, for instance, one is the Gregorian Calendar class, which is a concrete instance of a calendar. It's a Gregorian calendar, the current mod modern calendar that we are using. This API, which are all the methods available for the Gregorian Calendar class, are available from the Java API website. You can use the link in the lecture notes, or you can type in Google or any other search engine, Gregorian Calendar API, which will bring you to this. The two methods that we talk about here are the constructors. Gregorian Calendar creates a default Gregorian Calendar for the current time. And Gregorian calendar, which we specify the year, month, and day, and day, constructs uh, a Gregorian calendar with those specified values. Uh, for year and for date, we can actually specify values starting from one. But for month, uh, month is zero based. Basically, it uses zero for January, one for February, and so on up to 11 for December. Again, it's the reason for it is that in Java or in any other programming language, we start with the first element with index zero. So it's normal for programmers to start with zero for the first element, in this case, the month. So as we said, the calendar class is an abstract class. We see here that is in italic, which means that is an abstract class. We have various. Uh, methods for that class, like for instance, we have the constructor, which is invoked during constructor chaining. We have a get method, which we pass in an integer field, which is a constant specified in this class, like for instance, day, day of the month, year, and so on. Uh, and it returns an integer, which specifies the result. For instance, if I'm asking for the year, it returns an integer, which is the current year or the year of this calendar object. The set method, which allows us to set to a specified field a value. Again, we specify which field we want using a constant defined in the calendar class and the value that we want this to be uh, set to. And similarly, we, there is a method, overloaded method for set, which takes three integers. And those three integers must be the year, the month, and the day of the month. Again, the month starts with zero. So zero is for January, one is for February, and so on. For any field, we can get the actual maximum value. Like for instance, in the case of the month, that value, maximum value is 11. Because 11 is the number of months allowed in the Java Util calendar class. Get time returns a Java Util date object, which basically specifies the time using a the number of milliseconds from the Unix epoch time, uh, which is a single data field. And the set time allows us to specify a Java Util date and set the current calendar to that date specified the job by the Java Util date. Similarly, uh, we have the class Java Util cal Gregorian Calendar, which has only the constructors for Gregorian Calendar. It allows us to create a Gregorian calendar, a modern calendar for the current time, a Gregorian calendar for the year, month, and day, or a Gregorian calendar for the year, month, day, hour, minute, and second. All of this will be created in the current time zone set up for the operating system. So, for instance, if we are in the New York uh, Eastern time zone, it will create a Gregorian calendar with all the values set for a calendar for the current time zone. So 
the main method that we are using for accessing the data fields for a calendar are the get uh, integer field method. This method takes a field value and these values are specified as constants inside the calendar class. Calendar.year is the year of the calendar. It's basically a field value that specifies that we want the year. Similarly, calendar.month, calendar.date specifies the month and date. Calendar.hour specifies the hour in a 12-hour notation, so it will use 12 for the current hour in our, uh, in our time zone. Hour of the day uses 24-hour notation. It basically uses, let's say, 20 for 8 o'clock or 8 p.m. The minute is the minute in the current calendar object in our time zone, like 33 right now. The second is the second in the current calendar. Day of the week is the day number within the current week. It uses one for Sunday, then two is Monday, three is Tuesday, and so on, to seven is Saturday. Day of the month is the same as date. Day of the year is the current day in the year, starting with one for the first day of the year. Week of the month it specifies the current week within the month. Week of the year is the current week within the year. Both are one-based for the first week of the month or the first week of the year. And an indicator for AM or PM. Uh, AM is actually 0 as the constant 0 and PM is the constant 1. So how can we use it? First, we create a Gregorian calendar object. This Gregorian calendar object is assigned to a reference variable calendar, which could be of the abstract class calendar. So this is exactly an example where we assign a concrete object of a subclass through polymorphies to a reference type variable of the superclass, which is an abstract class. For that abstract class, we can get the current year using, in our case, calendar.get calendar.year. Calendar.year is a constant already defined in the class calendar, and it specifies that we want the field year of the current calendar object. Lowercase calendar is the reference variable. Uppercase calendar is the class Java Util calendar, uh, which is an abstract class. It contains co constants, like for instance, calendar.year, calendar.month, calendar.date, calendar.hour, calendar.hour of day, which is basically the 24-hour version of hour, calendar.minute, calendar.second, calendar.day of the week, calendar.day of the month, calendar.day of the year, calendar dot uh, week of the month and so on. So we can get the current object cal Gregorian calendar or we can create an object for a specified date and time. In this case I'm creating a calendar for January 1st 2020 and I want to see what day of the week will that calendar object be. Now, based on that value, the value of the day, to, day of the week, I can return for one Saturday, for, uh, for two Monday, and so on. This would be a method which returns a string representation of that day of the week. So let's do an example, and meanwhile we can take questions. So in this case, let's define a new class. I'm going to call it calendar test. Don't forget to import everything that you are using. So in this case, I'm going to import java.util.star because I should actually import java.util.calendar and java.util.gregorian calendar. I can do it in a single statement by importing everything from java.util. So let's create a calendar variable. as a new Gregorian calendar. This creates a Gregorian calendar for the current date and time. Then we could print, let's say for this we want to print 
the current year. So it will be C dot get calendar dot year is using the get method from the class calendar and it returns the year of the current calendar object. So let's actually precede it by specifying that what we are returning is the current year. Similarly, we can use the other methods to print other values. Like for instance, I could print what is the current month, date, uh, Let's see what else we want to print. We could print the hour, minute, and second. And for all of this, we have to use the correct constant in the field. So, month date or date of year, hour, second, minute. All of these are constants, so they are all capitalized, completely uppercase. We can get which day of the year is this. That's an interesting query. We can get what is the current week of the year. These are all interesting queries. If you don't remember these constants, you can always, after the dot, you can press a control space and it actually gives you all the constants or all the methods available in that class. So let's print all of this information. It prints up. 2017 month 6 because it starts with 0 for January so June is month uh, month 5 in uh, Java uh, day 27 hour is 0 because we started in a, a 12 hours uh, format if we want the hour to be 12 we can use hour of day In that case, it means for hour 12, minute 38, second 50, day of the year is 178, and week of the year is the week 26. If you want to see in a specific date, you can actually specify it in here. You can create a Gregorian calendar, let's say for 2020, January 1st. And in this case, it will print out that that... Uh, uh, if uh, these are the values for that specific date. Any questions? Okay, so let's continue. So interfaces. An interface is a class-like construct that contains only constants and abstract methods. And in order to understand why are they useful, we can actually try to reason what is actually in inheritance in Java. So for the specific, for the previous example, the example that we talked about, uh, uh, the triangle example, we can actually draw the diagram for our triangle example. So in this example, we have the object class which is inherited and uh, we have a subclass geometric object which is an abstract class so I'm going to precede it with a annotation that this is an abstract class in violet, we don't have italic, so we have to specify that this is an abstract class. Then there, w there is a subclass triangle, uh, 
with its properties and so on. These are all subclasses. So we have geometric object is a subclass of uh, object and triangle is a subclass of geometric object. What if we also want to say that geometric object is a class that can be cloned? That means that it's clo cloning is able for this class or a class that we can compare with other classes. In Java, we, can, we don't have multiple inheritors. We can't define uh, another class. Let's say this is the class clonable. And another class, let's say comparable. and specify that our class geometric object is a subclass, extends any one of those classes. In Java, it's not allowed to have multiple inheritors. This is not allowed in Java. So what we could do is to define that these are interfaces. It's a different type of uh, structure. It specifies only abstract methods. This interface contains the Let's say this is the comparable interface and has an abstract method, which is public. We can specify again with the, with the annotation abstract. Compare to, which takes another object. O, and returns an integer. Now, this is an abstract method. All that this interface does, it specifies that we want our class geometric object also to implement this method. So we can do it by using a different type of inheritance. This is called implements. So the geometric object also implements the comparable interface. We could actually have as many interfaces as we want. We could also have here another interface, comparable, and our class geometric object also implements that other interface, comparable. In fact, we can have as many interfaces as we want. These interfaces do not need all of them to implement, to specify methods. For instance, the comparable interface is called a marker interface. A marker interface is an interface that does not have any methods. So all that we now are saying is that a geometric object is also something that is uh, clonable. Sorry. It's also something that is clonable. So an interface is a class-like structure which allows us to have multiple inheritance in Java. Any questions before we continue? Okay, so let's continue and we'll see a couple of examples in a couple of seconds. So, an interface is similar to an abstract class with the intent that it only specifies behavior. That it means that it only has methods, and these methods are all abstract. For example, we want to specify that certain objects are comparable, edible, clonable, uh, colorable, like in the lab today, and so on. It allows multiple inheritance. In Java, you can only extend one superclass, but you can implement as many interfaces as you want. And those interfaces may extend as many interfaces as they want. We can define an interface using the interface keyword, like for instance, public interface interface name. And it only has constants declared and method signatures, abstract methods. For instance, we can define the, the interface edible and this interface edible has an abstract method how to eat, which returns a string. Only thing that it has is this abstract method. 
An interface is like a special class in Java. When we compa uh, compile it, it generates a class file, like a regular class. Like an abstract class, we cannot create an instance of an interface using the new operator. Uh, it, we can use the interface name as a data type for the variable, for a reference type variable, and as the result of casting. We can check if an object implements uh, it's an in instance of an interface type, and we can uh, cast it to that interface in order to call the methods from that interface. For example, we can declare the previous interface edible, which specifies that something is edible, and an abstract class how to eat. And the class chicken implements edible interface. So here we have that the class chicken extends a single superclass animal, but it implements the edible interface, which basically inherits now the constraint that any instance that, uh, that it implements the how to eat method. Any instance of chicken will have an how to eat method. And similarly, we can define an entire hierarchy of classes. So our interface edible in this example requires any subclass to implement the method how to eat. Then we have the class animal. Not every animal is uh, edible. So we have multiple subclasses. The class chicken extends animal and implements edible by implementing the method how to eat. The class tiger does not extend edible. It only uh, implements uh, animal, so it doesn't. In, uh, implement edible. So, uh, the class, the abstract class fruit is an abstract class and similarly we could have defined that the class animal is an abstract class. We don't need to. But uh, the abstract class fruit implements edible and the class apple extends fruit. It also implements the method how to eat. The class orange implements fruit, implements the method how to eat. It basically uh, returns a string, or make orange juice, and so on. And then we have a driver, test edible, where we have a main method. And this main method uh, can, uh, creates multiple objects. And these objects are new tiger, new chicken, and new apple. For every index in this array of objects, if the object is an instance of edible, then we can call the method how to eat if that object is first casted to the interface edible. So let's actually draw first the UML diagram for this specific class. So if we return to violet, and we can delete all of this because we are going to write a different diagram. The interface edible is an interface. So let's put it here. This is the interface edible. And it requires to implement a method, which we can define to be abstract, but it's not necessary for interfaces, because all the methods in interfaces are abstract. How to eat, which returns a string. And then we have subclasses of the class object. So let's actually represent the class object as the root class. And sub multiple subclasses, like for instance the class animal or fruit first. I'm going to move this a little bit because everything is, every fruit is edible. But then there are animals which are not edible. So let's implement another class. In this case, this will be animal. With two subclasses. The two subclasses are chicken and uh, tiger. Let's start with tiger on this side. And another subclass, which is chicken.
let's implement the inheritance hierarchy so these two are subclasses of object this is a subclass of animal and this is a subclass of animal but we have that fruit is also an, uh, implements the interface edible and chicken implements the interface edible there are also other subclasses of fruit and all fruits are edible so we'll have here the class orange and the class apple and they are both subclasses of fruit therefore they both implement also the interface edible if we move probably fruit the graph will look a little bit better maybe if we move the interface edible a little bit okay so it basically groups together properties like for instance chicken is edible and everything that is under fruit is edible it groups properties from different sides of the inheritance tree this is the inheritance tree so again we are going to start implementing this entire example let's create a new interface we call it edible the edible interface has a single method and we can specify that this is an abstract method but we can also leave it out because every method in, uh, in, in an interface is abstract so in this case the how to eat method returns a string and is an abstract method then we can implement our classes let's actually implement first the test driver class or test edible and this class contains multiple other classes in the same file we are going to implement the class animal and again you can actually define this to be an abstract class now that we learned about abstract and subclasses of animal like for instance the class tiger extends animal but does not implement the interface edible and the class chicken which extends animal and implements edible which requires us now to also implement the public string method how to eat which returns that some string uh, right let's say similarly we have other classes like for instance the abstract class fruit which doesn't need to implement the how to eat method because it's an abstract class it could leave it to the subclasses like for instance the class apple to implement the method how to eat And similarly we can define other subclasses of the class fruit like the class orange let's say we just return orange so in the main method for the edible test we can actually create an array of objects in this case it will be an object array of three elements and we can actually just enumerate the elements so this will be let's say a new tiger 
you use a default constructor, a new apple, and a new orange to be a little bit different than the lecture notes. For every object of the array A, we can check if this object O is an instance of the edible interface. Then we can print out the string returned by the edible interface for this object O. But in order to invoke the method how to eat, we need to cast O to an edible object. So it's edible O how to eat. Finally, we can run it and it prints the, three, the two uh, strings, one for apple and one for orange. Nothing for tiger because the tiger is not instance of edible. We count it tiger. Tiger eats us. Any questions? Good. So let's continue. So we can omit modifiers in interfaces because all the data fields in interfaces are public, static, final. Uh, all the methods in interfaces are public, abstract. So writing in an interface public, static, final before constants is equivalent with just defining the constant equal with a value. And writing public, abstract, and then method definitions, we can just specify the method definition or signature because it doesn't actually need the public abstract. A constant can be actually accessed using the interface name or the constant name like we did for the constants defined in the calendar class, calendar.year, calendar.month, calendar.date and so on. Now there are two interfaces which are standard in Java and we are actually using them most of the time when we compare strings, when we clone strings and so on. These are the comparable interface and later the clonable interface. The comparable interface is defined in the Java Lang package, is inherited by default. Uh, it's uh, in, in Java, you basically get it in uh, uh, the Java uh, uh, JVM virtual machine. And it has the following definition. It is in the package java.lang. It's an interface comparable. And it has a public abstract method compare to, which takes another object O and returns an integer value. This integer could be greater than zero, which basically means that the current object is greater than the object O that is passed as a parameter, could be equal with zero, which specifies that the current object is equal in content with the object passed as a parameter and it can be less than zero if the current object is less than the object O passed as a parameter. Most classes in Java implement this comparable interface. Like for instance the string class and the date class and the calendar class implement such comparable interface. And here we have two examples. So we have the class string which extends object and implements comparable, and the class date, which extends object and implements comparable. If you check in Java, if an instance of string is an instance of comparable, it will return true, because every new string is an instance of comparable. Similarly, every instance of Java util date is an instance of comparable. That means that you can compare easily dates. You can check if a date is less than another date. You don't need to check if the year is less or the month is less if it's the same year or the day is less if it's the same date and so on. Or you don't need to check the internal milliseconds since the Unix epoch time to compare dates. Similarly for strings, it does lexicographical order. It checks if the first two characters can be compared if they are equal, it goes to the next two characters. It finally gets to the first two characters that are different, the corresponding characters that are different, and it has the difference in, in Unicode codes of these two characters. So the class string, it 
extends the class object and implements the comparable interface. The comparable interface requires the class string to implement the method compare to to return the type of to return the difference between the two uh, strings. So as we see in this UML diagram, in UML diagram interfaces and the methods of interfaces are italicized or we can specify that everything in the interface is abstract. And dash lines and triangles are used to specify that the class implements an interface. We now can define methods like the max method, which are generic methods. They basically take instances of objects that are comparable. And if the value of the, the compare to method that is returned is greater than zero, it returns one object, object O1. In this case, the, the method returns an object that is comparable. Otherwise, it returns O2. So it doesn't matter if we invoke this method with uh, two dates or two strings, as in the example here, it returns the, second, the, the one that is bigger as the maximum. So this max method returns a comparable object as a return type. The max method on the right hand side takes two objects. It casts the first object to a comparable object before invoking the method compare to and returns again based on the value of compare to the one that is bigger. It returns O1 or it returns O2. So here in the date, in the second example, we have two dates and the max method returns a date. We need to cast the return value of the max method because in either case, the left or the right implementations, the return type is not the type that we actually assign to a reference variable. So in order to assign a date, we need to cast the result of max to a date. In order to assign a string, we need to cast the result of max to string explicitly. And we can write methods for sorting. Again, we don't need to know what type of objects we are sorting as long as they have the compare method. And that is the implementation of the arrays.sort method. It basically uses the compare to method to compare the objects. So the input type for sorting is an array of comparable objects. For instance, we can define our rectangles or a subclass of rectangle, comparable rectangle, to not only extend the class rectangle, but also implement the comparable interface. And we can use the method max to compare objects of the type comparable rectangle. Now for that, I will actually show you in the implementation. So I don't have the class rectangle. I will have to define it. So let's define a new class rectangle. This class rectangle extends geometric object. With additional data fields, private double width and the private double height. Both of them assigned one by default. We can also have constructors like the rectangle constructor, the default rectangle constructor, and similarly, we can have another constructor that takes two doubles and assigns them to the data fields width and height. So now, since we are extending the geometric object, we also need to implement the two methods get area and get perimeter. In the case of rectangle, the area will be the width 
multiply with the height and the perimeter will be twice the sum of the width and the height. We said that we are also going to implement and we need the constructor for geometric object which I don't think I have the default constructor. No, I have the default constructor. Let's see what is the issue. The issue is that I misspelled rectangle. So we said that we are going to also implement a new subclass of rectangle called comparable rectangle. And this extends rectangle but also implements comparable, which requires us now to implement the method compare to, which takes another object, in this case let's say that that is another comparable rectangle, and this is comparable rectangle, which is this object O cast it to a comparable rectangle. And we return which one of the areas is bigger. So for instance, if the current rectangle dot get area is greater than C dot get area, then we return one. Otherwise, if the current area is equal with the C dot get area, then we return zero. Otherwise, we return minus 1. This is a correct implementation of compare to. Now we can implement a static method, and this method doesn't have to be in this class. could be in a completely different class. Let's call it the class max. The class max could have a public static method. which returns a comparable object or just an object. This max method takes two comparable objects, O1 and O2, first we want to check if either one of them, so if the object is an instance of comparable and we can actually just use comparable. we cast to comparable the object O1 and then we can invoke the method compare to with the object O2. If the value returned by this comparison is greater than 0, we can return the object O1 as the maximum, otherwise we return the object O2 as the maximum. And why is this useful? Because now we can actually implement other methods. We can implement a method that returns from an array of objects the maximum element. So, for instance, another static method takes an array of objects. We overload the method object, uh, max. Takes an array of objects, let's call it A. And we can invoke the method, so for this array of objects, let's first define an object which is the maximum, max, and this object that is the maximum could be the first element of the array, and for every object in the array, we 
we can just return in the maximum the value of invoking the max method on the object O and the current maximum. And finally, we can return the maximum. Similarly, we can implement a sort method. This sort method could actually sort the elements in place. And again, it takes an array of... It's easier in this case to actually use uh, the comparable interface. This is an array of comparable objects, A. And we can implement select sort in this case. So, for every index, for every integer i starting from 0, and i is less than the length of that array, and i is incremented with 1 at every step, we can define a maximum. Let's, in this case, use comparable. which is a of i, and a maximum index, which is i. And we can actually iterate over the rest of the elements, starting from index i, plus 1, up to the end of the array, and for every element, if the result of max dot compare to the object a of i is less than zero. That basically means the current maximum is less than the object a of i. Then we can reassign the maximum temporary maximum to a of i, and the maximum index to i. Now, at this point, we know that the maximum is in the maximum index. We can swap the elements. So if the maximum index is different than i, then a of i could be assigned the max after we assign to a of maximum index a of i. And why is this useful? Because we can now actually invoke this method for anything that is comparable. For instance, let's assume that we have a string array or an array of objects which are or comparable objects which are strings. Let's say that we have the strings A, the string B, the string C, they don't have to be in order, so let's put D, B, C, and we can invoke the method sort, sort the array A, which sorts that array of strings. If we print now the strings for every object or comparable object, O in the array A, if we print the elements, it will print in order B, C, D, uh, in reverse order, because we put the maximums. Okay, we looked at the maximums. We, uh, this is a sorting in reverse order. I should have done minimum, but it's okay. Any questions? So the advantage of having such interfaces is that we can actually implement comparable in any subclass. For instance, the comparable rectangle could implement comparable, which requires us to implement the compare to method and return a value, depending if the current object is greater than O or not. And we can invoke these generic methods, like the max method returns the maximum rectangle, if it's, these are uh, comparable rectangles, or the sort method sorts an array of objects, no matter what are these objects. 
The second standard interface that we are going to learn today is the clonable interface. It's an empty interface. It has no methods. It's called a marker interface. It's used to denote the fact that the class possesses a certain property. Like for instance, any class that implements the comparable, the clonable interface is clonable. That means that we can create a clone of this class using the clone method. So, for instance, the class calendar from the Java API implements clonable. We can create a copy of a Gregorian calendar by using basically the clone method. So, first we have the calendar class. Calendar is a new Gregorian calendar for uh, February 1st, 2020. And then we have the calendar copy is a calendar cast of calendar.clone. Calendar.clone returns an object, therefore we need to clone to cast it to a calendar before we assign it to calendar copy. Finally, we print if the two calendars are equal. The two calendars are not equal in the sense that they have the same reference. But if we try to print if the two calendars have the same values of uh, date and time, we can use calendar.equals, which returns that is true. Every field of calendar is equal with uh, every field, a corresponding field of calendar copy. So when we implement this clonable interface, if we try to clone an object instance that does not implement the clonable interface, it throws a clone not supported exception. If we override the clone method from the object class, we can create custom clones. For instance, the clone method in the object class creates a new instance of the class in which lasts all the fields with exactly the same content as the previous uh, fields. So, in this case, we actually have two issues. One is, what if data fields are reference variables? If reference variables are cloned, we have new data fields with the same references. The second issue is that the clone method returns an object, object instance. So we need to cast it to whatever we want to return instead of the object class. Here we have an example of using clone. Let's assume that something clonable implements clonable. Uh, we basically said that this is a marker interface. We are not required to implement the clone method. The equals method uh, the, the, the says that the current object is equal with an object O if the current object is, S is assigned uh, something clonable O and returns true. This is not correctly a correct implementation of equals because it basically doesn't return it always returns true. It doesn't return that the two objects are actually equal. But it's good enough. Now the main method check, uh, creates a clone of the object S1 and returns and uh, checks if the two objects are the same or not. With the double equal operator, it actually returns that the two objects uh, have the same reference and they don't. It returns false. With the equals method, it returns, uh, it basically returns true, because that is what we are returning here. So here we have an example. House is implements clonable and comparable. We are going to implement this in, the, in our class uh, 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 geometric object as part of the lab today. So as part of the lab today, let's open our class geometric object and specify that the geometric object implements comparable and clonable. Now we are not actually required to implement the clonable method, uh, uh, the clone method, because this is the marker interface. It will actually everything will be clonable by defining that is that the class geometric object implements co uh, clonable. But we are required to implement the compare to method because we specify that is comparable. So let's implement it directly here. 
we can have a very good implementation of comparable because we have the abstract method get area. So public int compare to another object O doesn't matter what type of geometric object is this. We cast first that geometric object to a geometric object G. And then we compare the two objects using the area. If the current object, this dot get area, is greater than the object G's get area, then we return the integer 1. Else, if the current area is equal of the current object is equal with the object G get area then we return the integer 0 otherwise we return minus 1 and you can put else statement or not it doesn't have an implementation of get area that method was abstract but we know that any subclass of that class of this class must have an implementation of get area okay any questions let's return back to the implementation and see if there are any questions good so i will show you one more thing before we move to other abstract classes one the other thing is the difference between shallow copies and deep copies so we have this house. A house is built on a certain date, the current date, and it has a surface uh, area and so on. So house 1 was a house created before, and house 2 is a clone of the first house. If we are cloning with the default cloning uh, that we inherit from the superclass object, it clones the binary representation of the object. So in the case of reference type data fields, it copies the reference into the new reference when built for the second house 2. Now that when built date is actually shared between the two instances. So it is not quite correct. If we are a company that builds houses by just duplicating the previous house, it actually, the date of creating each house is different. So this is called a shallow copy. If the field is of a reference type, the reference is copied rather than the content by creating a copy of the went build. So this type of copying is called shallow, shallow cloning or shallow copying. If we want to make a deep copy, we also have to clone the when build into a new date object and for that new date, we can create a clone and redirect the when build for the current house to this new clone object. In that case, we actually do a deep copy or a deep clone. So we actually clone the house, then we uh, redirect the when build data field to a clone of the when build. If we do it for all the reference types, uh, type data fields, we are creating a deep copy or a deep clone. Any questions? Good. Now, what is the difference between interfaces and abstract classes? In an interface, the data must be a constant. Every data must be constant in abstract classes. They can have data types. Interfaces do not have constructors. Abstract classes, they all have constructors, either explicit or implicit constructors. In interfaces, every method must be abstract. In uh, abstract classes, uh, you can have concrete methods. 
So here is a comparison from all of these points of view between abstract classes and interfaces. Regarding data fields or variables, there are no restrictions in abstract classes. In interfaces, we can only have constants, which are public, static, final. In abstract classes, we can invoke the constructors, and constructors are defined. They can be invoked during constructor chaining. But we cannot create instances of abstract classes using the new operator. For interfaces, there are no constructors. An interface also cannot be constructed using the new operator. Abstract classes have no restrictions about methods. You can have abstract methods, concrete methods, no abstract methods, anything you want. For interfaces, all methods are public abstract. An interface can, a class can implement multiple interfaces. An interface can extend multiple interfaces. There are, there is no root for interfaces. So for classes, we know that there is a root, which is the object class. For interfaces, there, there is no root. It basically means that any interface can implement multiple interfaces. Any class can implement multiple interfaces. So for instance, an instance of the class uh, two uh, class here is also an instance of the interfaces 2, 1, 2, 2, and by inheritance of interface 1, interface 1, 1, 1, 2. The only problem that can arise is when we define constants. If we try to define the same constant name with different values in two interfaces and the class implements both interfaces, we'll have a compiler error. We cannot implement both interfaces because they share the same constant name with different values. Similarly, if we implement two interfaces where each interface has a different a method, uh, uh, the same method uh, with the same inputs, but different return types. So these are all errors detected by the compiler. You cannot implement two interfaces with conflicting information like the same constant with different values, or the same method signature with the different return type. It is a personal decision of when to use interfaces and classes. If the relationship that we try to implement is a strong relationship of parent-child relationship, like, for instance, a staff member is a person, a circle is a geometric object then we have to use uh, classes. If it's a weaker type of uh, is a relationship, like for instance, it indicates that an object possesses a certain property, like a behavior, then it should be modeled using interfaces. Like for instance, all strings are comparable, all strings must now implement, the string class must implement the comparable interface. We, must in, we, we could use interfaces to uh, circumvent single inheritance restriction if multiple inheritance is desired, because multiple inheritance between classes is not accepted in Java. Now, talking about uh, abstract classes, the chapter in the textbook also covers a different set of classes called wrapper classes. Uh, because of the fact that primitive data types are not objects in Java, uh, we can have better performance. However, when we define uh, array lists or any other type of collections in Java, the type of elements of collections are object instances. So in Java, every primitive type uh, has a wrapper class, which corresponds to the respective primitive type. Like, for instance, the primitive type Boolean has the wrapper type capitalized boolean. The primitive type car has the wrapper type character, and so on for the numbers, short, byte, int, integer, long, float, and double. All the instances of uh, numbers are subclasses of the number class. So double is a subclass of number, float is a subclass of number, and so on. The wrapper classes all override the method to string, equals, and hash code defined in the object class. Since these classes also implement the comparable interface, 
they can be compared using the, comp to the compare to method. And that is why we can sort integer arrays using the arrays.sort method. The number class is this class that is the super class of all the number or, uh, uh, wrapper types in Java. In, uh, implements various methods. Implements the methods or the, up, the methods double value, float value, int value, long value, and so on. It converts all of these numbers to the corresponding primitive type values. Uh, the method values, double value, float value, int value, are abstract. We can implement those methods in the subclasses if we implement our own uh, subclass of number. Like, for instance, at the end of the chapter, we implement a rational number. We can implement also c complex numbers using basically the square root of minus 1, uh, multiply with a real number as the imaginary part. The methods byte value and short value are not abstract because we can always return a byte or a short as the int, the byte and the short value of int value. Each numeric wrapper type implements the abstract methods double value, float value, int value, and long value. So here we have two examples. The integer wrapper type extends number, the abstract class number, and it defines a value of the type int. The double wrapper type it also extends the class number and uses a data field value of the type double. Both classes implement the comparable interface. So, and here we have other methods available in these classes. So we can always construct explicitly objects of these classes, or we can rely on Java to create instance objects of these classes. This is called in Java uh, boxing and unboxing. We can create an array of integers and just pass integers, but automatically these integers are boxed into objects of the type integer object, and vice versa. We can create integer objects and assign them to primitive type variables or in places where we want primitive types and automatically we have unboxing. These uh, objects are translated into the primitive type. More importantly for us, there are two types called big integer and big decimal which can store very big values or high precision for double values. Big integer can represent any integer of any size, and big decimal has no limit for precision, as long as it's finite. Like, for instance, we can divide 1 with 3, we get 0 0.3 in a period, but we can keep a certain number of digits after the decimal point. Like, for instance, I want the first 100 trees, and that's it. They also extend the number class and implement the comparable interface. We can compute very big values using these uh, types. So, for instance, for big integer, we can print big integers that cannot be represented in the integer types. Uh, we can also print and use big decimals, like, for instance, the big decimal 1.0, the big decimal for 3, and then we can divide big decimals 1.0 with 3 and keep the first 20 digits. We can also compute very big values, like for instance factorial of 50 could be computed using the big integer type and stored in Java as long as it fits in memory. Any number that fits in memory can be represented now with big integer in Java. Finally, Let's say that we want to implement our own rational class. This could also represent 1 divided by 3, and 1 divided by 3 has uh, basically an, an infinite number of trees after the decimal point if we represent it as a double. But what we can do is to implement any operations for rationals like add, subtract, divide with itself inside the class. And you will find the implementation in the lecture notes, which uses numerator and denominator as two data fields and implements all of those methods.
for instance, the method add multiplies the numerator of the current rational number with the second rational number denominator and the denominator of the first rational number with the second one's numerator. And then it uh, defines a new rational number of this new numerator and a new denominator, which is the product of the two denominators of the current number and the second number. And this is the result, which is another rational number written by add. Similarly, we can define other methods. That's all about abstract classes and interfaces. I will stop the recording, and if you have any questions, we can take them now.